Yo, what's up, everyone, and welcome to episode three of Coffee and Perspective with Jaystein. Today, I have the great pleasure to bring you what I can call the friend of 25 years. I did the maths before this, uh, Mr. Matthew Kemp. So, I'm very excited to have him on today because although I do have quite a large entertainment uh, network and an entertainment base, and um, a lot of my content is based around the arts and entertainment. Uh, Matthew is a currently a director of a law firm in Port Elizabeth. And um, before I share too much, because uh, I do know quite a bit about him already, um, Matthew, say what's up to everyone and let them know who you are, what you do, and just a brief background. Awesome. Thanks, Chase. Yeah, um, 25 years is a long time to be friends, definitely. So um, we do definitely know a lot about one another. Um, hello everyone, it's very nice to join all of you and um, as Jay said, I'm an attorney in South Africa in Port Elizabeth and I'm a director of a firm called Pagdens and um, Pagdens has been around for 120 years and um, we specialize in, in a lot of different areas of law um, and, and I fit into that picture and um, yeah, I'm very excited to share some of my perspectives with everyone. Yeah, the, um, so I'm not that that educated in the law field uh naturally um and it's i mean even though we've we've known each other since we were four or five years old um i could never exactly pinpoint the time that you were like law is what i want to do law is the direction i want to take with my career um so at what point did you realize that this is something i'm interested in firstly and secondly, this is definitely what I want to study and what I want to do. So I would be lying if I said I wanted to be a lawyer all my life because I didn't actually want to be a lawyer. Mm -hmm. um, I, I remember um, at a stage in high school talking about careers. I think we were sort of getting to that stage where we had to choose our subjects and yeah. um, from grade nine to grade 10, and you've got to decide what subjects you want to take. Yes. And they put us on this little computer program sitting there in the computer labs at, um, at school. Yeah. And we had to click all these answers, yes and no. And it was one of know. those, it was one of those like generalized aptitude tests, no? Exactly. Yes, yes. yes. And it so generates like a, an answer for you at the end of five careers that you could be suited in. Yeah. Yeah. And 
I thought at that stage that I wanted to be a medical doctor. So everything that I ticked, I was trying to tick to make it come out that I was going to be a medical doctor. And I didn't have any other professions really in mind mm. um, other than professional sportsmen. But I mean, that's like a, that's like a pop dream. I think every kid at some stage has. Yeah. And I remember law coming up as like my highest um, score. And that was the first time that I thought, okay, that's not something I was really thinking about. Mm. So this is the first time it came up on your radar, basically, of this is a possibility. Definitely. Mm -hmm. Definitely. And um, so I remember asking my parents um, about it, kind of like, well, have you guys ever thought about law? And, th and they actually said to me, well, we thought law would be a great career for you. Um, and they encouraged it. So it was something that was definitely on my radar at that stage. Mm. And it was when we got towards the end of school that I realized that um, I'd done some more research by then. I mean, I, I knew at that stage that it's something that suits me. Mm. Um, and I think the, the thing that made the difference is in a subject like maths, for example, yeah. quite good at maths, but it wasn't necessarily because I'm, I, I was talented with numbers. It was more because I had an analytical mind that, that likes a challenge. So I like solving problems. Mm -hmm. um, and, and coupled with that, you know, if you're just looking at it from a subject point of view, um, I had a strong English um, uh, language sort of um, mark as well uh, through, throughout school. So mm -hmm. when you combine those two things, you start realizing that that's exactly what law entails. It's problem solving, analytical thinking, and being able to utilize, um, to express yourself and utilize language to yeah. be able to convince whoever you need to convince of your argument. So yeah, it was, it's, I don't want to say it was a mechanical process. I mean, there's obviously sort of a intuition that goes with it as well. And you, you try to work out your purpose in life, I suppose, if you want to go deep. But, but you know, I think the mechanics were, were there. Um, and when I started studying it, I realized I really enjoyed it. So that the rest was history. Uh, so so when, you, when you went, okay, this is the part where, and maybe this could help some people watching that are still trying to figure out um, what they would like to do one day. Um, so even, even though you're going through this mechanical process, let's call it that you said, um, when you made the decision, was it because, oh, this seemed like a good idea and because I had the skill sets? And then once you got into it, only then were you like, okay, I could potentially have some form of passion for this. Or did you think, okay, I was passionate about law. Whenever I would read anything about court cases or I would watch Law and Order or whatever you know, TV series was on, um, was this something that you saw this is a real interest or was it more the mechanical process? And then only once you got into your first, second year, did you go, okay, this really is for me. So um, it definitely was at first, you know, that grade nine to matric process was definitely a mechanical process. Mm -hmm. I mean, at the time you, you're so young, you're so naive, you don't really know how things work. Um, I didn't have the benefit in those days. We didn't do bring a child to work day or anything like that. Yeah. Um, which I think is a great, great um, initiative um, to help you figure things out. But what I, what I found is um, once I'd made the decision, so I think somewhere in grade 11, the year before you finish school, um, you have really made your decision. You know what you're going to study. Yeah. And I started to read up about it. Mm -hmm. I found that it excited me to, to, to find out what I was going to be learning when I got to university. There was like a little, it's almost like a, you, you, you want to read more. You, it's like, you want to know more. You want to figure out more. It yeah. feels like this, this challenge that um, is going to be exciting to, to learn about. Mm -hmm. As um, if you put anything else in front of me, if you ask me to, read up, if, if you told me at that stage, you can change and you can maybe do a, a BSc in like marine biology and you put that information in front of me, I, I, I wouldn't have had that same That's response. Mm -hmm. I get it. It didn't excite me. So I think there was something deeper. There was definitely like a, a feeling of purpose that I could almost, I could almost see like a, a future starting to unfold and that excited me. 
yeah, a look, definite there, leap of faith. There's, I mean, I can speak for myself, um, but I'm sure there's a lot of a lot of uh, people that even that are deep into their careers now, if they have to think back, that, you know, when you are 18, 17, 18, okay, going into university, if you go to university or if you don't, nothing wrong. But if you go into university, um, there's a lot of people that do their first year, sometimes even the second year and go, this isn't for me. Law is not for me. Psychology is not for me. Architecture is not for me. Um, so, you know, I think it's, in your position, you were very fortunate to have then had that interest really sparked within your first year um, and not just, you know, blowing your first year uh, where I know a lot of parents or guidance will go take a gap year, um, figure out what you want to do with your life. But I mean, you, you will never know until you deeply really get into it. Isn't that, I mean, that's at least what I, no, that, 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 that's, that's my personal opinion on it. Um, you, won't, um, you won't know what you really enjoy doing until you actually get your hands dirty and actually do it. Um, you're not going to know if you enjoy law. Like I still, I will never know if I would have enjoyed law because I never went into it. Um, I never, there was nothing that sparked that interest for me. So therefore I didn't get into it. Um, but yeah, I, you know, if you're fortunate enough that you got into it and, and it sparked your career, and from what I know and from what I understand, you've turned out to be a damn good lawyer. Um, and for all the right reasons. Well, yeah, um, I, I, I hope that um, I, I, can, I can take that compliment and claim it. I mean, you know, you, you're always going to make mistakes and you're always going to have... Part of the process. Yeah, there's, you know, there's always going to be someone in the other corner going, um, oh, no, you terrible are you this or you that mm -hmm. um but you know certainly there's been a trajectory in my career that um i can certainly claim as um being successful and and being something that i'm proud of yeah and it was and there was there was a process i mean um i didn't rock up at day one of university and the lecturer just you know looked into me and said wow you're the chosen one you know you're just going to be this amazing amazing lawyer in law and yeah. everything just magically fell into place. Yeah. There, there was a, there, there was, there's a journey and there still is a journey. Yeah. Um, so if I can just jump in on that journey, you, you do how many years to help me and maybe some people are watching, how many years do you have to do before you get to your articles? So, so yeah, so in South Africa, um, to to just do a straight law degree, um, it's a four year LLB degree. Yeah, and that's the path I chose. There are sort of other paths that are the, the standard that I took is four years. At then, then you do two years articles, correct? Correct. And so if you want to make is, oh, now articles is when you actually in the field with a firm that have taken you on and you you basically learning on the job, correct? That's yeah, that's exactly correct. So share, once you do, share some, share some uh, insights or some uh, through your journey um, after your varsity that got into the articles, uh, share some of the, the good. And if you are able to, um, I don't know how much needs to be kept confidential, but share some of the bad that, that potentially, or some of the struggles that you had during your articles. Yeah. So look, I mean, you come out of university and you've learned textbook style um how to what what law is okay and um you then go into your articles at a law firm and you know <laughs> you start at an absolute like z base zero yeah uh, just, just knowing the 10 steps of law yeah you know the subject textbook yeah yeah um, so you kind of have a, have a 2D view of law and you, need to, you walk into a world of 3D um, all of a sudden and you've got to try and just hit the ground running. And a lot of the time, unfortunately, the people above you, the directors, the associates at the law firm you're working at, they've forgotten that when they started, they started at that ground zero. Yeah. And they forget what you do know and what you don't know. Mm -hmm. So what happened with me is I was just like, thrown in the deep end I was given things that that I had to do that I had to just which I know now I mean looking back it was half ridiculous that I was getting given these things to do but 
just I didn't know any better, so I took things on and I and I ran with Sorry, it. At, at that point of time, are you saying that you got given things that you weren't experienced enough with, or you had no clue what it was about, what you had to do because you had never learned that, or or how how was it over your head? So to give you an example, um, there's a, a process that any case that comes before court, the 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 documents which are often like this thick or, or, or thicker. Mm. Um, have to be indexed. So you have to draft a little uh, page or two numbering, you know, hitting All the this, this page to this page, next one, this page to this page. And that needs to be handed in at court at least two and a half days before the matter is going to be heard at court, right? So no one teaches you how to do this at university. And in my first week of articles, I was given two of these things to do. The and each of them... 200 to 300 pages um, worth of documents and I didn't know any I mean none of those documents made sense to me I didn't know what order they were supposed to be placed in mm. I didn't know what they represented it was like complete gibberish to me yeah but I, but I just assumed that it's reasonable for me to figure it out so I figured it out I put them in the right order I had to google everything basically and um and I ended up putting them in the right order, um, but they were completely, you know, it was a complete mess. And I ended up taking it to the court and handing it in. But what they don't teach you is that when you hand it in at the court, you've got to tell the lady or the, the gentleman behind the counter, this case is on the roll next Tuesday. Otherwise, they have so no idea what date it's meant they've to be. Mm -hmm. They've got no idea. And, the, and now, of course, they don't ask you. They don't say, is this on the roll in the next week or two? Yeah. They just, they assume, you know, so it's like, okay. So I handed these documents in. Now, unfortunately, when you, when you uplift anything from the court, you've got to write your name on a little register there. Yeah. So the following Tuesday, all of a sudden my phone starts ringing and it's my boss and he's saying, your name's just been read out in court. Now in open court, there's like 50 different people sitting there. Some of them were people that I studied with. People sending me in those days, it was BVM. People sending me BVMs. Your name's just been read out in court. The judge is angry with you. They're saying, what? who's Not Matthew? There. Where's the court? Where are the documents that are meant to be in this court file? And they were ready to throw the whole case out. And I was confused and I was stressing. Yeah. So anyway, I said, well, I handed it in. And lo and behold, the court documents were sitting there at the general court office with... Um, the lady who I gave it to, she didn't know where to put it because I didn't tell her what day it was what on. What day it was on the roll, yeah. And um, so my, in my first two weeks, I became the notorious um, candidate attorney who didn't know how to index <laughs> and, a file and, and where never, to put it. And they never came to court. And they never came to court. So um, my advocate was obviously very angry with me. The judge was very angry with me and my yeah. boss was very angry. Yeah. Um, but so you learn. Uh, as you learn, as you learn. And is that one of the, the more memorable um, stories that you have for your articles? Or the, yeah, I'm, for, I'm sure you've probably got a, 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 I'm sure you can write a book um, <laughs> of them, but it, it, you're trying to get that it's those sort of things that it would have just taken maybe not even a direct or not even like, you know, just someone that's been there and that kind of knows the process, you know, and that's just the second level up. They could have said, oh, just a heads up. You need to inform them this you know, X, Y, Z, you have to tell them about the dates, what day, et cetera, et cetera. Um, Correct. Uh, anyone that I now give an instruction like that to in yeah. the first month or two, I, I just give them the, like a list of things that they need to do. And I'll tell them about all the mistakes that I made um, where I bumped my head. And you know, these things, they, they blow over. I mean, you, you, of, you live. Of course they blow over, but I mean, like you say, if you can take those and I'll help the next, you know, candidate attorney that's under you um, and you can guide them and just give them those little points it takes an extra second just to say, Oh, by the way, you know, exactly. um, and then another thing that I would like to know is that, so you went through the articles process between actually working as a, uh, after your articles, uh, you sworn into Associate, court. Yeah. Yeah. Um, yeah. You get admitted. You get admitted. Sorry. Get sworn in as if you're a prince um, pretty much like so you get admitted into the courts and then 
at what stage, just give everyone a, a, a bit of insight into, um, cause you can choose different specialities of law of what type of law you, you specialize in. So at this current time, what, what law do you specialize in and how did you come to wanting to specialize in that type of law? Oh, so look, um, I specialize at the moment in labor law and general litigation. So in other words, like court cases, um, whereas, you know, there's other areas of law, there's property law, which is generally conveyancing mm -hmm. property. Transfers. Um, there's people who specialize in drafting wills and administering estates when people pass away. Mm -hmm. There's other lawyers who specialize in just doing commercial contracts and advising corporates on how to um, negotiate certain transactions. So where I fit in is labor law, so your employment disputes, and then um, general litigation where two companies sue each other. Okay. And the way that I, the way that I got there um, is through my articles, I was fortunate to be given exposure to different departments. So I touched on the different areas. Um, in my second year, I, I worked in a commercial department where um, Bless her, but the director that was above me was really tough, um, really, you know, held me to, to a high standard and, and let me know uh, in no uncertain terms on a daily basis if I just slightly didn't quite meet those standards. So it was tough, but, yeah. you know, you, you learn from that and you, and you get stronger um, as a result. And what happened with me is when I got admitted, um, there was two people in the firm that I was at that moved in one month of each other. Mm -hmm. And they both worked in the litigation department at that firm. Um, so at, while at the time I was starting to specialize in labor law because it was something that I had a special interest in, um, there was a need in the law firm that I was at for someone to step into the litigation shoes. Yeah. And, um, and I put my hand up and, and found that I really enjoyed it. You know, I, I found that going to court and preparing for trials and cross-examining witnesses and getting results for, for clients. Um, that was something that I, I thrived on. I yeah. uh, really enjoyed it. Mm. And, um, and that kind of led me to having this hybrid practice where I specialize in, in two different areas. You know, some people specialize in one, others in one or two. Um, but I, I liked having that dual practice. If, if you're able to, I mean, you know, and if you can do it, properly why not you know um and knowing you you do speak well and i find it super interesting that i mean i'm sure you you, you know you probably touched on this a little bit during your studies as well that the cross-examining is is a super important tool because you could have someone that maybe isn't so alert and that potentially could be lying um in court and yeah. and then you use that psychological because it is use that psychological skill set to basically get them to confess their own lies in court correct yeah definitely um you know cross-examination is is an art i mean there's some um advocates and attorneys in um south africa who have like made a name for themselves for being able to cross-examine and it's interesting because you said it's number one, it's a psychological thing. You, sure. you have to get into the mind of the witness and to be able to do that, you've got to have um, an emotional intelligence. So, you know, there's a, there's an EQ element to being able to cross examine. Yeah. Um, and secondly, there's a, another interesting thing. You've got to have a really strong memory. So um, you'll, you'll find that when you're preparing for a trial, there is like, there are hundreds of documents sometimes that you've got to be able to go through, whether it's photographs, whether it's contracts. Um, sometimes it's even WhatsApp messages that people have passed between one another yeah. and have said, and you've got to almost have that like all stored here in your, in your mind. And you've got to funnel the, the witness down a path that you have pre-prepared in, in, in your preparation. Mm -hmm. And when they're giving bringing, the evidence, bringing in all those parts of information to get them to, to split their words. And it's not, you know, it, it can sound very disingenuous. It can almost sound like you're trying to manipulate. And, and that's not really the spirit behind it. The, you know, I think there, there probably are people out there who do use it for that purpose. For me, 
it's a case of really believing in your client's case and understanding that what the person, the person you cross examining, um, they are not necessarily telling the truth. And you know that because you've stored all that information in your mind and you're able to recall it. So my greatest victories have been where someone has said something and I've been able to go, hang on, I know that that's page 124 of bundle B, um, grab bundle B, scroll to page 124, there's my little highlighter. They've said something that directly, um, you know, Those contradicts what they've just said. And you can, and you can sort of take them to that. And, 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 and so that's where the, the art really comes in. And I enjoy that challenge. Yeah. We cross -examine. Then besides just going to court and doing what, look, I mean, a lot of people that, that will be watching, they've watched suits, they've watched law and order, they've watched uh, all these um, law based TV shows. Um, and I know a lot of it is set in the, in the American format of how the, you know, how they work with juries and all that, um, which it's slightly different in South African law from what I'm aware. And, right. uh, <laughs> and, and I think a lot of people get into the, or they will be getting into the law game because of such, um, such TV series, uh, because it's painting the picture of the Harvey Specters. It's painting the picture of you get to wear a suit, walk into a fancy building, get paid tons of money and be quick with your words. Um, is it, am I correct in saying that that is not the case most of the time? You are correct. And um, it's interesting because, you know, if you take suits as an example, um, and I, I've watched it, I watched it, especially as a student, the first three seasons. Yeah. And you see Mark Ross, this young maverick, you know, he's just got this supercomputer for a brain. And, you know, he, he kind of just, wings at half the time and mm. he's able to recall like these movie scenes that um someone used once upon a time that he now incorporates into his little solution that he and they and you know and, and they use these like off the cuff um weird like um uh, almost like extortion type type oh, move yes put is. someone in their place yeah you know really i i Sometimes I'm even sitting there watching these programs and thinking to myself, imagine I spoke to my opponent the way that these guys are speaking to these guys right now. It, it, I would be crucified. Yeah, it's not realistic. In the law reports, you, you really, you find that law is, is um, you know, it's suits paints it to be this beautiful sunny day at the beach. Glamorous. Whereas law really is yeah. like the overcast, cloudy skies, dull, you know, keep things in this little, in this little like box over here yeah. and, and stick to the formula yeah. um, type of environment. Yeah, yeah. there's a, I, I do know one uh, or numerous occasions, um, which I'd like you to share if it's possible. I know that you've had some interesting, uh, how can I say, interesting, of course, everything between you and your clients is confidential, everything that you do in the law firm. Is generally confidential, but uh, I know that you've had to do a couple of uh, extra activities, let's say, um, which I'm sure, being a pirate, which I'm sure you, when you were studying and when you got into the law field, you probably not in a million years thought that this was something that you would be doing. Uh, uh, why I'm keeping it very under wraps is in case you, you can't share this, but uh, if it's possible, share this story or something, something which you, you realize that I never knew, you know, this is not suits. Um, this is really something where you getting, you know, your hands dirty. Yeah. So, um, you know, as I said, law generally is very much the, the straight and narrow black and white keep, you know, very formal, but every now and again, I've had the, I, I suppose it's almost like a privilege um to get involved in some very interesting <laughs> a privilege um, scenarios let's call it that mm. uh, um i just have this knack i don't know what it is about my career and it keeps it interesting but i i seem to find myself in some very interesting situations that you, you know i didn't expect as a student and the one in particular that i know you're hinting towards 
um, is is a, a, a story where um, every now and again there is a dispute between ship owners. Okay, and these, um, are, commercial, these are commercial ships now. Commercial okay, ships, yeah. and yeah. Um, so you know, one is able to um, if if a particular ship owned by a ship owner comes into the port of Port Elizabeth, um, sometimes an instruction will come through for us to bring an application to court to do what's called arrest that ship, okay? So that's just a, it's the term used to say that you get a court order that can be served on the captain of that ship that says you may not move out of these waters until such time as your ship owner has paid whatever it is that he owes, maybe lawsuit, uh, yeah. company or whatever. Mm -hmm. Um, or it's been settled or something. So, you know, the very first one of these that I ever did, um, I just moved to Pagden's, which is the firm that I, that I currently practice at. And, um, you know, I, I didn't, I'd never done anything like this before. You knew that you knew, you're the new guy at the firm. So you also want to prove yourself. You want to show that you can do your, do your thing. So um, this instruction came through and I, I decided that I needed to go out, you know, the sheriff has to go, sheriff of the court has to go out to the ship and he has to physically get onto the ship to serve the court order on the captain of the ship. I mean, so that the captain of the ship knows. And in a, in a world, in an age of emails, um, you would think that you would just be able to email it in through, email. but the yeah. court rules are very clear. It has to be served physically. So I went out on this little, um, it was smaller than a tugboat. It's, it's called a port boat. It's like a tiny little thing with a, a crew of four people um, from the from the harbour. And off we went um, about five nautical miles out to sea to to the side of the ship. And um, we thought, okay, well, the sheriff can now climb up the side of the ship. And, and these uh, guys on the ship threw down this little rope ladder. Um, like, like you said, like, Captain Phillips. That little, yeah, the little rope with little wooden slats that go up the side of the, the little wooden, exactly the, the the kind of thing that you climb up when you're a five year old at a park. Yeah, when you when you're playing at a jungle gym. Yeah, um, the sheriff that was with me, Sham, he was a, a very large gentleman. He he told me he weighed 150 kilograms. He was six foot four, mm -hmm. um. And he had no way that he was going to be able to climb this this, this ladder. Yeah. So um, and it's, and it's you know, sorry, and, and this is somewhat dangerous as well. Like unless you're a sailor, um, and this is what you're used to doing. I mean, even for a fit person, it's it's not normal to climb up this rope ladder on the side of a ship. Definitely not. I mean, you you got to actually do training to um, be able be to. Able to do. Yeah. Yeah. And um, I mean, you've got a situation where you're out at sea. So the, the little boat that you're on is, is moving up and down in the swell. And the ship itself is also, you know, moving. I mean, it's maybe not as violently, but it definitely is moving. So, you know, I decided, well, I've got to do something. Um, the sheriff isn't going to be able to go up the ship, but I, I don't want to let the opportunity go by and we don't serve our documents. You know, what if the ship uh, sails off? So... I got on the shoulders of um, one of the people that, that were the crew members of this port boat. And as the swell moved up, I managed to grab onto the rope ladder and started climbing. And I got to the top and got pulled onto the ship. And I was taken to the captain's uh, quarters who, who couldn't speak English. Um, and for the next hour of my life, I sat locked in a captain's cabin, um, arguing with this gentleman about um, about the the, the uh, court serve on him. You could barely speak English. And he couldn't speak English. So I had to speak to his lawyers who um, were, were from England. And, um, you know, it was quite a, quite a process mm. um, until eventually he kicked me off his ship and he made me climb back down the, the ladder back onto my port, port boat and off we sailed back. But did, um, did you did you manage to get those documents delivered on that trip? Um, yes. Oh, yeah. So I, I I told this gentleman that um, if he didn't accept the papers, um, I was going to send the port police to arrest, arrest him. Yeah. Now, 
um, I genuinely believe that we had port police, but you know, apparently, uh, the, the port police are maybe not as present as what they are maybe in other in other countries. Mm -hmm. um, so so anyway, but you know, the whole thing eventually ended up um, with us going back out again. Um, on the boat um, after the captain's lawyers had explained the process to him. Mm. Um, and we were able to, um, there were certain documents he didn't, he didn't release to us and there were certain documents I wasn't able to give to him. So what we did is we took, took a little rope and put it in a bag and the people lifted the bag up of the documents we needed to get to them. And they put, put the documents we needed from them on a, in the bag and lowered it down to us. Yeah. Yeah. So, you know, lawfully, everything was done properly. Um, but, you know, it was definitely a, um, a, a, a scary, scary moment. And, climbing and, up the and, side and of if I'm correct in saying you've, you've done this on more than one occasion, this wasn't just the only occasion. Yeah, so I have been, I have been, um, well, I have done these things a couple more times, but what happened, what happened since then mm. is, um, the sheriff had an accident, um, falling off one of these and, rope ladders. And he passed away, unfortunately. And, and he passed away, yeah. yeah. So what happens now is um, instead of us physically going out with, with the port boat, we just sit in the um, port controls offices and we radio through. Um, and the law has been adjusted to cater for these dangerous um, situations. To climb on the, on the ships. Yeah. yeah. But so I, I'm, I'm glad climbing. you told that story because... Like I say, there's there's a lot of people that have this painted picture or this painted perception of law being, oh, you just battle it out in court and you just, you know, um, try to get the upper hand and get the evidence, you know, and everything else that you see and you wear a suit and tie and you make tons of money. But, um, but yeah, I think that that's a very um, somewhat humorous, but also important uh, story that I wanted you to share if it was possible because that people can know that it's not just, you know, what, what you might think um, a lawyer has to do or, or someone in law has to do, but there's, there's a lot more to it, like climbing up rope ladders. Um, and then just for the people that are going to be watching on, on Facebook and YouTube, um, what through everyone's career, they, of course, it's, it's a lot better if you have a passion for something that you're doing. I'm super, um, I'm super like pushed for that point that, that it's really important that you need to have at least some form of passion for what you're doing um, and some form of interest. Otherwise, it's going to become just a job from day to day. So besides the, the passion, I think we link it up to... Um, for example, me with what we do in entertainment, what we do with, with the business. Um, besides me being super passionate about the entertainment industry, I've got my why of why I do what I do. Um, what do I want to get? What do I want to achieve when I entertain people? What do I want to achieve with my partners and the people that we work with within the Empire Entertainment? So for you, what... I mean, this could be quite a, quite a long formed answer, but in summary, what is your, your why to why you do law? When you get up, when you go, when you have these difficult cases where um, you might have a difficult client, you know, uh, you know, the situation is not, not going to be a, definitely going to be a, a smooth sale, which they normally aren't, but uh, what keeps you pushing and what, what is that why? to you doing law, to you practicing law every single day? So, you know, um, the, the, real, the real impact that law can have on a person's life, on a company's um, success, success mm -hmm. on a society at large is, is massive. Um, it provides the boundaries. And, you know, I think a lot, of, a lot of people have this perception of law that, you know, you're just in it to try and mess people around and, you know, suck everyone, drive every cent that you can to 
your own gain or maybe your client's gain. Mm. And I believe that that is necessarily true. For me, you know, if I do my job properly and my client comes to me in a situation where they really need assistance genuinely because, you know, a business hasn't paid them um, and they're trying to use unlawful reasons not to pay mm. or, um, you know, maybe a company is, is in financial distress and it really needs a solution that has um, as, as, min, as little impact on its staff as possible, but, you know, which, which has integrity to it. Mm. Um, or perhaps, perhaps, you know, you've got a situation where someone has really been done in, um, in some way, and you can, you can use law to be able to make a difference in that person's life. Just to find that, that, is, bit of, just to find that bit of justice for them. Precisely. Yeah. So that is my, that is my why. And to couple it with, um, you know, as a, as a lawyer, you, you tend to take a lot of abuse um, for whatever reason. It's just a, it's an environment where um, it's competitive. So your opponent is always going to, to give you stick. Yeah, and times um, are high generally. Exactly. Your, your client often is in an emotional state over the situation they find themselves in. So mm. they are going to lash out if you, if you need to apply law. And sometimes law isn't always exactly fair. So, you know, it takes, it takes some, some, some hard, it's almost like a tough love scenario um, where you explaining law that's not going to benefit your client, but it's, it's the way that the law is. So you, you don't want to let them run into something that's going to leave them in a worse position. Yeah. And, I, you know, knowing, knowing that if I'm able to, to do my job properly, I can bring cases to court that is going to benefit those people, maybe change law um, in a way that's, that's going to help make things more clear or um, make society uh, a, better, um, a better run um, organization, if, if that's a way to put it. Mm -hmm. That, that gives me a, a sense of purpose to know that I can have that impact when, when I'm doing my job properly. Yeah. So the, make, the making the difference in someone's life or someone's corporate life, which indirectly will impact hundreds of other lives potentially. Um, Correct. Yeah. With the decisions that they, that they do. Mr. Matthew Kemp, I appreciate your time. Um, before we go, let everyone know, I will link it in the description uh, once, once we're done with the live, with the live chat, um, just that when people watch it back, they, they will be able to contact you, um, whether it be just to, to say about something that they found interesting or something that they, that really hit a point with them during our chat, um, or whether they'll just like to connect, maybe someone's needing some legal representation. And if it's not particularly your specialization, You've got uh, you've got some very talented people within your firm that you can that you can connect them with. Um, so just let us know where can we where can we connect with you? Where can where can people make contact with you directly? Sure. So um, uh, I am on LinkedIn and Instagram. So if you wanting to contact me on LinkedIn, it's um, Matthew James Kemp. You'll you'll find me there. Um, and then on Instagram at Matt Kemp zero two one. Um, you can you can direct message me on Instagram and um, I'll be happy to help anyone where I can. Great. Um, yeah, sure. So I'll I'll find your direct links so that people can just click on it. They'll they'll be able to um, connect with you in either way. Um, so for those of you that are watching, I hope that you got something out of this between uh, Mr. Director Kemp and and myself. Um, I know it's out of the 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 usual of what i generally like to speak about so this is some really interesting and insightful um facts into the law law world uh, because like it or not we all the law affects all of us in some shape or form um so it's something something super interesting and something that we should uh kind of have a bit of a like we've i've learned quite a bit from chatting now um to get some some deeper insights that we, we know who we can contact um, when we need the help and so that we don't get misfairly treated throughout life um, in any corporate ways. Kemp, I thank you for your time. Um, 
for those that are watching, please like, share it with those who might find this interesting. Um, your mother, your father, your aunt, your uncle, whoever. And, uh, and yeah, it's been a pleasure having you on as my third guest. This is Coffee and Perspective 003 with Jay Steen and my good friend and advocate. <laughs> it, it, sounds, it, 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 it sounds so strange saying it, uh, Mr. Matthew Kemp. Thanks, everyone, and have a good Thank day. You. We'll chat soon.